Conversation, live from Nicaragua. Dive deep into the world of coffee with co-founders of Twin Engine Coffee, Andrea Wolverton and Colin Ganley. Welcome to Brewing Conversation. This is Season Zero, Episode 9. My name is Andrea Wolverton. And I'm Colin Ganley. And the subject we're going to discuss today is the research. What does it take? What did we do to prepare to move to Nicaragua from Italy, being two Americans living in Italy, moving to Nicaragua in a country with a language that we were not fluent in and that we didn't really understand all that well. Right, right. Well, I mean, so, of course, so this was two, when was that? So, well, we started, I mean, I think like 2011, probably reading. 2000, maybe end of 2000. I mean, I think you've always kind of had it up your sleeve somewhere. So maybe you started way before that. But so there's some resources we learned that. Well, let's take people back in in case they haven't heard the previous episodes. So I've been traveling to Nicaragua since about 2004. And I was traveling here for work and had seen six of the big cities around the country, but only sort of lightly and spent a lot of time in a couple different cities, Esteli and Managua, which were both places we did not want to live. We liked the idea of Nicaragua, but not necessarily those cities. They weren't exactly what we were looking for. But in traveling around to Leon and Granada, San Juan del Sur, Matagalpa, you know, take places like this, we discovered some places that we thought were very livable and very interesting and, and might be a nice lifestyle for us. So anyway, we decided to move here But we really needed to figure out what was it going to be like to try to start a business? Well, because there's what you read and reality. And so what we were finding is that through some different international development organizations, Nicaragua had published incentives. So there were um, supposedly programs for investment, tax-free. The import duties here are quite high. So those kind of tax-free... incentives can well can be significant in dollar terms so we were we were looking at that we were looking at well we were how did we get our dog i mean for me i was you know i have I had my 11 year old lime runner <laughs> there was no way i was leaving duke so that that took that took a fair bit of energy it turned out to be super easy but the papers were very intimidating because i was doing them from italy to nicaragua well, and you don't really know with a dog if you're going to land somewhere and find out that your paperwork was insufficient and that they're going to want to kennel the thing for months at a time. Right, which was a pretty scary prospect, which I've learned only happens in a few countries around the world. But um, then there's all of our stuff, um, which we've stuff, stuff, stuff. We've, I think we've learned the value of uh, paring down. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Trying to... Um, I mean, I think at the... On a fundamental level, you know, when you're when you're looking at moving to a new country, you have to know: Are you legally allowed as a foreign citizen to own land, or are have a you bank account? Allowed to have a bank account? Are you allowed to start a company? Will you need to have a local person be one of the owners of the company? These are all things that, in different countries, there are different regulations and laws ar- around them, and, and we needed to be pretty clear about that stuff before we got here. Or we we thought we did. I mean, what we found is that it's virtually impossible to understand another country's institutions until you live it, like getting a driver's license and, you know, the reality versus what's on paper. But we um, we tried to dot our I's and <laughs> cross our T's as much as one can do from uh, from abroad. And then, um, so what did we actually do? So you came, I was still... I was still working. I was still doing some consulting. And then you came from and, and set up shop, right? So you, you yeah. came and bought a vehicle and rented a house. Yeah. And filled the refrigerator with food. And filled the refrigerator with food. Yeah. We started to figure out how we were going to get packaging material into the country and different things like that. That was, it took months really to get everything figured out from the roaster to the packaging material, all that international stuff, the nas- the local stuff about like buying coffee and finding the farmers was a whole separate. Yeah, I mean, I think what is really not obvious to someone who doesn't live in Nicaragua is that, I mean, the raw materials are beautiful, but anything to add value, so any machinery, packaging, et cetera, 
at any decent, you know, competitive price, there's just not an industry here. So that virtually all of it has to be imported. And so where we found ourselves in this interesting situation as a small family, trying, you know, starting a small family business was that we had to become an importer and exporter. We had to, you know, play in the big leagues and, we, you know, well, we just figured it out and just started doing that. But it wasn't, you know, I guess one becomes a bit um, accustomed, spoiled, if you say, to to companies where you can buy 20 boxes at a time. And so we went to look for packing boxes and they're like, oh, well, you can only get it in this free trade zone manufacturer and your minimum order is 2,000 boxes of one size. <laughs> so A, 2,000 boxes, you know, you know, it's a large capital outlay for a small company, but it takes up a lot of space. Like where are you going to put 2,000 boxes? So, and that was the case. You know, that was story after story of those type of things, which I don't know that research could have answered that exactly. I mean, unless you're just really going deep before you move. But in a lot of ways, we just had to take the well, that's, leap. That's part of how we get value out of Nicaragua, too, is because we started this company with our savings and we didn't want to go into debt for it. So we're able here to rent a bigger space than we could in, say, the United States with the same amount of money. And so we've been able to do some things more economically, as people would say, than we could in another place. And, and so we, we've definitely benefited from that. There are a lot of things here, though, that are more expensive than they are in, say, the United States is a good comparison to make. So for example, a car here costs 30 or 40% more, even on the used market, than it does in the United States. Right. The all appliances, um, it's all because of uh, transport. I mean, it's basic arbitrage. I mean, transport costs and duties. Yeah, so you're looking at 30 to 40%, sometimes higher import duties. Um, so there are values that you can find here, but there are also there are things that are tremendously expensive and, and hard to anticipate before you get here because you don't start evaluating the cost of tape before you actually get there. Right. It's just not one of the things you look into. Right. I mean, as far as the research, I guess a lot of time was spent on residency, um, you know, just trying to do as much due diligence as we could. However, in the end, I mean, so many things turned out differently. I, th I think about when I, I we host a lot of university students and so there's this tendency of someone and maybe when I was 20 it was the same I don't know but it, this tendency okay so how did you know this and did this lead to this and wanting to create this linear path of exactly how it's going to turn out and and you know a lot of time I mean in the end most of the things that the research it was helpful but it it turned out pretty far from the actual experience so I didn't do a lot of research outside of talking to all the people I knew here, which is, I guess, quite a bit. But you actually did a, a sort of a more formal investigation into what coffee was like in Nicaragua. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So um, it was part of the month or so that I spent here specifically. It was fun I was funded to specifically come and just really trying to understand the whole coffee value chain from the farmer to the patios and the drying facilities and then packaging, you know, where's coffee going? Where's it coming from? Um, and then what do, and at the end of the day, they, what do the supermarkets look like? like? What, who are the players? Are there membership organizations? Are they cooperatives? Um, so to be clear, so, you, when you say you were funded, one of the benefits of your previous uh, contract with the United Nations was that you were given one week per year of, independent research where you could research something of interest to you that would maybe benefit them, but it was just part of your contract, right? And so you used that? To yeah, I ended up getting, negotiating a month to be able to come and, yeah, and research this. Because a lot of my work was working in developing countries and looking at those issues. And so I wanted to hone in on coffee and what was being, what products were being made in country of high value. And so, yeah, I was able to come in here um, or who, come here. With who the, did you meet with? So, well, you know, it's funny. I stayed at La Bastilla Coffee Estates and the 
manager who's from Costa Rica set up some nice appointments. So I, I spent half the time there, like really trying to understand production and what that looks like. And then the other part of the time I spent in Managua, and that was um, talking to different membership organizations, export organizations. I met with the head of one of the main local supermarket chains, um, different, just different players in the, because again, I was still thinking about soup. (laughs) I was still thinking about healthy foods, fast, healthy foods. And so I was really trying to understand basically like continuing my research that I had done in East and West Africa here in Central America and Nicaragua. And uh, so that was a lot of fun asking a lot of questions. And that's where I just remember like in what is now La La Colonia, uh, that was probably seven years ago of the whole freezer section, just being frozen French fries. And wow, what a, what a change now what is available there. So there's been an explosion of artisanal products trying to add value here, which is, which is great for the economy. So in hindsight, and I, I talked to a bunch of people, asked them what it was like to have a business, start a business here. You did that research. We did our internet research, et cetera. Do you think that the research was sufficient to prepare us for a move to Nicaragua? Oy. I don't think there is research that is sufficient for someone, you know, we are not from Latin America or Spain or or a Latin, if you will, in the true sense of the word background. So there are just different cultural, I I don't, I, and and plus I had only in a developing, undeveloped, however you want to refer to it. I think it's really hard to anticipate the institutions, bureaucracies, I mean, these kind of things you just, until you feel it. I I mean, the residency requirements were, were helpful. You know, I mean, it was helpful to study those laws, but I don't really, I don't know what else I would have researched because if you research too much, I think we just wouldn't have done it. Yeah. I mean, had someone said, oh, well, here's the deal. I don't know. I don't, I, I really don't. I don't know. I've been like, oh, man, I don't know. that sounds hard. That sounds a lot harder than I think. It's, I mean, we thought it was going to be a challenge, but there's been some um, sweat and tears, blood, sweat and tears in the real sense um, that I, you know, totally didn't anticipate. I don't think any entrepreneur does. Yeah, I think it's kind of like what we were talking about with the naming of the company. At some point, you just have to say, OK, I've learned what I think I can. I could spend more time looking, but at some point you just have to take the leap and yeah. just decide. To I mean, it. it's the classic economic idea, you know, expectations or projections based upon past behavior. I mean, you can research, 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 but you can't predict the future. And that's what we often forget, that it's not going to stay the same necessarily. And so that's, you know, that's been part of um, a big part of uh, what we're doing. But yeah, it's also why I don't, I have gotten out of the habit giving really specific advice here of, oh, well, this is exactly how this works here. Because what I found is that, or what we found, I think is that many people have really different experiences. And so um, there are things that are written down and then that's a guide. And then um, it's just kind of, it's going to go the way it goes. So if you were to, to wrap things up, let's, even though you're not in the habit of giving advice, I'm going to ask you to give advice. If somebody was considering moving to a foreign country to start up a business and live, what would be your one piece of advice that you would give to them? Well, I think the the basic, what are the legal requirements for me to own a business <laughs> seem to get overlooked a lot. Like, can I get residency and can I open the basic things to start a business? on the technical side, but on the more touchy feely side, there's a tendency to be constantly comparing it to what you believe is the way it should be, the way it was in your country, et cetera. And it's not that kind of, every country, well, in most cases are sovereign countries with their own rules. And the sooner you can let go of what you think it should be, versus what it is and how you're going to move forward in that. Well, just the happier and more content you'll be because, man, fighting that every day is is a lot of work. 
So thanks for listening and we'll catch you on the next one. This has been Brewing Conversation with Andrea Wolverton and Colin Ganley. Thank you for listening. For more connection to coffee and Twin Engine Coffee, go to TwinEngineCoffee.com or email us. We'd love to hear from you.